title is An Introduction to Deep Learning. So please welcome Jeff. Good morning, thanks for coming. Okay, I'd uh, like to start by uh, thanking Tariq Rashid for giving his excellent, gentle introduction to neural networks. I'm going to build upon that uh, and hopefully, t uh, hopefully uh, show you how to um, develop some of the networks that have been used to get uh, the really good computer vision results that we've seen recently. So our focus is mainly going to be on image processing this morning. And this talk is, I'm going to cover more the principles and the maths behind it than the code. And the reason is, it's quite a big topic, there's quite a lot to go through, and we've got to squeeze it into an hour, so a um, little less code, but hey, I hope it's useful. So, a quick overview of what we're going to go through. We are going to discuss the Theano library, which is the one I personally use, although there's also libraries like TensorFlow. Um, we're going to cover the basic model of what is a neural network, just building on Tariq's talk. Then we're going to go, for, go through convolutional networks. And these are some of the networks that have been getting the really, really good results that we've seen recently. Then we'll look briefly at Lasagna, which is another Python library that builds on top of Theano to make it easier to build neural networks. We'll discuss why it's there and what it does. And then I'll give you a few hints about how to actually build a neural network, you know, how to actually structure it, what layers to choose. Um, just, just so you have a rough idea on how to train them, a few, uh, just a few hints and, hints and tips to practically get going. And then finally, uh, time permitting, I'll go through, through the OxfordNet VGG network, which is how to use a pre-trained network that you can download under Creative Commons from Oxford University. How to use that yourself, uh, because uh, I'll go through why it's useful to sometimes use a, a network that somebody else has trained for you, and then tweak it for your own purposes. Now, the nice thing is there are some talk materials. This is uh, based off a tutorial I gave at Pi Day to London uh, in May. And if you check out the GitHub repo there, Bright Fury Deep Learning uh, Tutorial Pi Day to 2016, you'll find that there's the GitHub repo there. All the notebooks are viewable on GitHub, so you should be able to see everything there in your browser. I would ask, though, that please, please, please do not try and run this code during the talk, and the reason is, is because when you run the stuff that uses the VGGNet Oxford net models, that will need to download a 500 meg weights file, and you will kill the Wi-Fi if you all start doing that. So uh, please do that in your own time, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, also, uh, yep, there's, if you want to get more in depth about Theano and Lasagna, I've put up some slides. If you check out my speaker deck profile, there'll be the, to, there'll be this talk slides, and there'll also be intro to Theano and Lasagna as well. So that will give you a breakdown of Python code using Theano and Lasagna, what it does and how to use it. Um, and furthermore, if you don't have a machine available or you don't want to set it up yourself, the, I've set up an uh, Amazon AMI for you. So if you want to go use one of their GPUs, you can go and grab a hold of that and uh, run all the code there. Everything's all set up and I hope it's all relatively easy to get into. All right, now time to get into the meat of the talk. And what better place to start than ImageNet? ImageNet is an academic image classification data set. You've got about a million images. I think it might be even more now. They're divided into a thousand different classes, so you've got various different types of dog, various different types of cat, flowers, buckets, whatever else, whatever you can come up with, rocks, snails. And the way the ground truths, as in, you've got a bunch of images that have been scraped off Flickr, and you've got to provide a ground truth of what each image is. And the way all those are prepared is they went and got some people to do it over Amazon Mechanical Turk. Now, the top five challenge. What you've got to do is you've got to produce a classifier that when it, given an image, will produce a, a probability score of what it thinks it is. And you score a hit if the ground truth class, the actual true class, is somewhere within, your, within your, your, um, your neural network or whatever it is you use, it's top five choices for what it thinks the image is. And in 2012, the best approaches at the time used a lot of handcrafted features. For those of you familiar with computer vision, these are things like SIFT, HOGS, Fisher vectors, and they stick it into like a classifier, maybe linear classifier, and the top five error rate was around 25%. And then the game changed. 
Kozewski, Sutskiver, and Hinton in their paper, ImageNet Classification with Deep Convolutional Neural Networks, a bit of a mouthful, they managed to get the error rate down to 15%. And in the last few years, more modern network architectures have got it down further. Now we're down to about 5 to 7%. Um, I think people like Google and Microsoft even got down to 3 or 4 And I hope that this talk is going to give you an idea of how that's done. OK, let's have a quick, quick uh, run over Theano. Neural network software comes in two flavors, or it's kind of on a spectrum, really. You've got the kind of neural network toolkits that are quite high level at one end, and at the other end, you've got expression compilers. Um, a neural network toolkit, you specify the neural network in terms of layers. With expression compilers, they're somewhat lower level, and you're going to describe the mathematical expressions that Tariq covered that, uh, that are behind the layers that effectively describe the network. And it's a more powerful and flexible approach. Theano is an expression compiler. You're going to write NumPy style expressions, and it's going to compile it to either C to run on your CPU or CUDA to run on, your, on an NVIDIA GPU if you have one of those available. And uh, once again, if you want to go have it get, an, uh, get an intro to that, there are my slides there that I mentioned earlier. There's a, lot more to, there's a lot more to Theano, so go check out the deeplearning.net website to learn more about it and find out about that. That gives you the full description of the API and everything it'll do, uh, some of which you may want to use. There are, of course, others. There's TensorFlow developed by Google, and that's gaining popularity really fast these days, so that may well be the future. We'll see. OK, what is a neural network? Well, we're going to cover a fair bit of what Tariq covered in the previous talk, but it's got multiple layers, and the data propagates through each layer, and it's transformed as it goes through. So we might start out with our image of a bunch of bananas. It's going to go through the first hidden layer and get transformed into a different representation, and then get transformed again to the next hidden layer. And finally, we end up with, assuming we're doing an image classifier, we end up with a probability vector. Effectively, all the values in that vector will sum up to 1, and our predicted, uh, our predicted class is the corresponding uh, row in the probability vector, element in the probability vector, rather, that has the highest probability. OK. And this is what our network kind of looks like. We see there are weights that you saw in the previous talk uh, that uh, connect, all the, connect all the units between the layers. And you see our data being put in on the input and propagating through and arriving at the output. Breaking down a single layer of a neural network, we've got our input, which is basically which is a vector, an array of numbers. We multiply by our weights matrix, which are the crazy lines. And then we add a bias term, which is simply an offset. You just add a vector. And then you have our activation function, or nonlinearity. Those terms are roughly interchangeable. And that's, that's the output layer activation, is what then goes into the next layer, or the output if it's the last layer in the network. Mathematically speaking, x is our input vector, y is our output. We represent our weights by, a bi by the weights matrix. That's one of the parameters of our network. Our other parameter is the bias. We've got our nonlinearity function. And normally, these days, that's really rectified linear unit. It's about as simple as they come. It's simply max of x and 0. That is the most, that's, the po that's the activation function that's become the most popular recently. In a nutshell, y equals f of wx plus b, repeated for each layer as it goes through. And that's basically a neural network, just that same formula repeated over and over once for each layer. And to uh, make an image classifier, we're going to take the pixels from our image, we're going to splat them out into a vector to stretch them out row by row, run them through the network, and get our result. So in summary, our neural network is built from layers, each of which is a matrix multiplication, then add bias, then apply nonlinearity. OK, and how to train a neural network? We've got to learn values for our parameters, the weights and the biases for every layer. And for that, we use bat propagation. We're going to initialize our weights randomly. There'll be a little more on this later. We're going to initialize the biases all to 0. And then for each example in our training set, 
we want to evaluate, as Tariq said, we've got to evaluate our, our network's prediction, see what it reckons the output is, compare it to the, uh, the, actual training, the actual training output, what it should produce given that input. We've got to measure our cost function, which is roughly speaking the error. That's the difference between what our network is predicting and what it should predict, the ground truth output. Now, the cost function is kind of important, so we'll just go and discuss that a little bit. For classification, where the idea is given an input and a bunch of categories, which category best describes this input? Our final layer, we use a function called softmax as our nonlinearity our non -linearity or activation function and outputs a vector of class probabilities. Uh, the best way of thinking about it is, let's say I've got a bunch of numbers and I sum them all up and then I divide each element by the sum. That will give us roughly the proportion or a probability, assuming all of our numbers to start with are positive. But they can also go negative in a neural network, so what we, with the softmax is, adds one little wrinkle. Before summing the, what we do is we take our input numbers, we compute the exponent of them all, and then we sum them up and we divide the exponent by the sum of the exponents. That's softmax. And then our cost function, our error function, is negative log likelihood, also known as categorical cross-entropy. Um, to do that, you've got to take the log of you. If you let's just say you have an image of a dog. You, take, you uh, run the image through the network. You see what the predicted probability is for dog. You take the log of that probability, which is going to be negative. If its predicted probability is 1, it's going to, the log of that's going to be 0. If it's like 0 0.1, it's going to be quite strongly negative. You negate, that, you negate that log, and so the idea is um, if, if it's supposed to output dog, it should give a probability of 1. If it's giving a probability of less than that, the, log, the negative log of that will be quite positive, which indicates high error. So that's your cost. Now, regression is, is different. Uh, rather than classifying an input and saying which category closely matches this, you're trying to quantify it. Um, you might be measuring the strength of something or the strength of some response. Typically, with that, your final layer doesn't have an activation function. It's just uh, identity, linear. And your cost is going to be sum of squared difference. Then what we've got to do with our neural network is we've got to reduce the cost, reduce the error, using gradient descent. And what we have to do is we have to compute the derivative, the gradient of the cost, with respect to our parameters, which is all our weights and all our biases within our layers. The cool thing about it is Theano does the symbolic differentiation for you. I can tell you right now that you don't want to be in a situation where you have this massive expression for your neural network, and you've got to go and compute the derivative of the cost with respect to some parameter by hand, because you will make a mistake. You will flip a minus sign somewhere, and then your network won't learn, and debugging it will be a goddamn nightmare, because it'll be really hard to figure out where it's gone wrong. So uh, get a, I would recommend getting a, um, a, symbol, a symbolic mathematical package to do it for you, or use something like Theano that just handles it all, and literally you write that code there, the cost by the weight is the ano grad cost weight. And other toolkits do this as well, just to save you time and sanity. Um, then you update your parameters. You take your weights and you subtract the learning rate, which is lambda, uh, multiplied by the gradient. Um, and I generally recommend that learning rate should be somewhere in the region of uh, one, 1 times 10 to the minus 4 to 1 times 10 to the minus 2, something in that region. Um, you're also going to, you typically don't train one example at once. You're going to take what's known as a mini batch of about 100 samples from your data set. You're going to compute the cost of each of those samples, average all the costs together, and then compute the derivative of that average cost with respect to all of your parameters. Um, and then the idea is you end up with an average. And that, uh, the idea is that uh, it means that you get about 100 samples processed in parallel, and that means when you run it on a GPU, that tends to speed things up a lot because it uses all of the, uh, the parallel processing power of a GPU. Training on all the examples in your entire training set is called an epoch, and you often run through multiple epochs to train your neural network, something like two or 300. So in summary, take a mini batch of training samples, 
evaluate, run, run them through the network, measure the average error, error or cost across the mini batch, and use gradient descent to modify the parameters to reduce the cost, and repeat the above until done. All right. Multi-layer perceptron. This is the simplest neural network architecture, and it's nothing we haven't seen so far. It uses only what are known as fully connected or dense layers. And in a dense layer, each unit is connected to every single unit in the previous layer. And to carry on, uh, from, to pick up from Tariq's talk, um, MNIST, the MNIST handwritten digits data set is, uh, is a good, good place to start. A neural network with two hidden layers, both the 256 units, after 300 iterations, gets about 1.83% validation set error. So it's about 98.17% accuracy, which is pretty good. However, these handwritten digits are quite a special case. All the digits are nicely centered within the image. They're roughly the same position, scaled to about the same size. And you can see that in the examples there. And our fully connected networks have one weakness. There's no translational invariance. If imagine you want to like, okay, take an image and detect, it's got to detect a ball somewhere over in the image. Um, what it effectively means is you, uh, it's, it'll only learn to pick, it up, pick up the ball in the position where it's been seen so far. It won't learn to generalize it across all positions in the image. And one of the cool things we can do is if we take the weights that we learn and we say take, a, we take, an, we take one of the neurons or one of the units in the first hidden layer and take the strengths of the weights that link them to all the pixels in the input layer and visualize that that's what you end up with. So you see that your first hidden layer, the weights, uh, are effectively form a bunch of little feature detectors that detect, pick up the various strokes that make up the digits. Um, so it's kind of cool to visualize it, but that shows you how the, the dense layers are translationally dependent. Um, and so for general imagery, like say if you want to detect cats, dogs, various eyes and everything that makes up the various little creatures and all the various things, you've got to have a training set large enough to have every single possible feature in every single location of all the images. And uh, you've got to have a network that's got enough units to represent all this variation. Um, okay, so you're going to have a training set in the trillions, a neural network with billions and billions of nodes, and um, you're going to have enough, you're going to need enough about all the computers in the world and the heat death of the universe in order to train it. So, moving on, convolutional networks is how we address that. Convolution. It's a fairly common operation in computer vision and signal processing. You're going to slide a con convolutional kernel over the image. And what you do is you imagine, say, the image pixels are in one layer. You're going to take your kernel, which has got a bunch of, uh, bunch of little weights, a bunch of little values, and you're going to multiply the value in the kernel by the pixel underneath it uh, for, all the, for, all the, uh, for all the values in the kernel. And you're going to take those, those, uh, that, those um, products and sum them all up. And I'm going to slide the kernel over one position, do the same. Slide it over this, do the, one, do the, do the same. And uh, what you end up with is an output. And, well, they're often used for feature detection. So a brief detour, Gabor filters. Uh, if we produce these, bunch of, uh, produce these filters, which are a product of a, of a sine wave and a, a, a Gaussian function, you end up with these little uh, sort of... Uh, these little wave, these little soft circular wave things. And if you do the convolution, you'll see that they act as a feature detector that detects certain features in the image. So you can see how it roughly corresponds. You can see the ones with the vertical bars there roughly pick out the vertical lines in the image of the bananas. The horizontal bars pick out the horizontal lines. And you can see how convolution acts, convolutions act as a feature detector. And they use pretty much, they use quite a lot for that. So back on track to convolutional networks, Back, we'll have a look uh, for a quick recap. That's what our fully connected layer looks like with all of our inputs connected to all of our outputs. In a convolutional layer, you'll notice that the node on the right is only connected to a small neighborhood of nodes on the left. And the next node down is only connected to a small corresponding neighborhood. The weights are also shared. 
So that means you use the same value for all the red weights and for all the greens and for all the yellows. And the values of these weights form that kernel, that feature detector. And for practical computer vision, whether you're producing the kernels manually or learning them like in a convolutional network, um, more than one kernel has to be used because you've got to extract a variety of features. It's not, off, it's not sufficient just to be able to detect all the, just the horizontal edges. You want to detect the vertical ones and all the other various orientations and sizes as well. So you've got to have a range of kernels. So you're going to have different weight kernels. And the, output, the idea is you've got an image there with one channel on the input and about three channels on the output. Or what you might find in a typical convolutional network, you might actually have about 48 channels or 256. I'll show you some examples later of some architectures. And you end up with some uh, very high dimensionality in the sort of uh, channels output. But um, OK. So each kernel connects to all pixels in the ch or connects to the pixels in all channels in the previous layer. So it draws in it draws in data from all channels in the previous layer. However, the maths is still the same. And the reason is is because a convolution can be expressed as a multiplication by a weight matrix. It's just that the weight matrix is quite sparse, but we, the math doesn't really change as far as uh, conceptually. Um, and that's fortunate for us because it means that the, the gradient descent and everything we've done so far just still works. Um, as for how you go about figuring that out, um, I'd just recommend letting Theana do that for you. <laughs> I wouldn't do it myself. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and there's one more thing we need, downsampling. So typically if you've, done, if you've worked in Photoshop or GIMP or any of these other image editing packages, you might want to shrink an image down by a certain amount, say by 50%. Um, you want to shrink the resolution. And for that we use two operations, either max pooling or striding. Max pooling, what you're going to do is you can see, each, you see that little image up there is divided into four colored blocks. Say the blue block has four pixels. What we do is we take those four pixels, we pick the one with the maximum value, and we use that. So rather than averaging, we just take the maximum. And that's max pooling. And it downsamples the image by, by the factor p if p is the sort of size of the, of the pooling. Um, and it operates on each channel independently. Uh, the other option is striding. Uh, and what, what you do there is you effectively pick a sample, skip a few, pick a sample, skip a few. It's, it's even simpler. Um, it's, it's often quite a lot faster because what you can do is uh, the, a lot of the convolution operations support strided convolutions where rather than, uh, rather than taking sort of um, producing the output and throwing some away, they just effectively jump over by a few pixels each time. So that, that's faster and you get similar results. So moving on. Uh, Jan LeCun used convolutional networks to crack the, to solve the image, the MNIST data set in 1995, and this is a simplified version of his architecture. Uh, what you've got is you've got uh, 20 kernels, you've got this 28 by 28 input image, one channel because it's monochrome. You've got 20 kernels, five by five, so they reduce the image to 24 by 24, but it's now 20 channels deep. Max pool, shrink it by half. Then we have 50 kernels, 5 by 5. And now we've got a 50 channel image, 8 by 8. Max pool, shrink it by half. And then we flatten it, and f uh, you do a fully connected dense layer to 256 units. And finally, fully connected to our 10 unit output layer for our prob class probabilities. And after 300 iterations over the training set, we get 99.21% accuracy. 0.79% error rate is not too bad. And what about the learned kernels? It's interesting to think about what the feature detectors it's picking up. So if you look at, say, a big data set like ImageNet, this is, that, this is the Krzyzewski paper that I mentioned right at the beginning. These are the kernels that get learned by the neural network. And for comparison, you can see Gabor filters over there. Now, the reason the color ones are at the bottom is just because of the, the way they did the actual thing involving two GPUs and the way they split it up. But, if you look at the top row, you can see how it's picked up all these various little edge detectors of various sizes and orientations. That's the first layer. Uh, uh, Zyler and Fergus took it a little further, and they figured out a way of visualizing the kernels, uh, how they respond to the second layer. So you can see you've got kernels there that respond to various sort of slightly more complex features, things like squares and you know, curved, uh, sort of curved um, texture, little sort of eye-like features or circular features. 
And then further up on about layer three, you get somewhat more complex features still, where you've got things that rep recognize parts of sim simple parts of objects. OK, so this gives you an idea of roughly how the convolutional networks fit together. Uh, they operate as sort of uh, feature detectors, where each layer builds on the previous one, picking up ever more complex features. OK, now I'll move on to lasagna. If you want to specify your network using the mathematical expressions using Theano, it's really powerful, but it's quite low level. If you have to write out your neural network as mathematical expressions and numpy expressions each time, it could get a bit painful. Um, lasagna builds on top of it, and it makes it nicer to build networks uh, using Theano. And its API, rather than just allowing you to specify mathematical expressions, you can construct layers of the network. Um, but you can also then get the expressions for the output for its output or loss. And it's quite a thin layer on top of Theano, so it's worth understanding the Theano. But the cool thing about it is, if you have one of these mathematical expression compilers, if you want to come up with some crazy new loss function or do something new and crazy, whatever it is you like, or you want to be sort of inventive, you can just go write out the maths and let Theano take care of figuring out how to run that using CUDA, using uh, NVIDIA's CUDA, so you don't have to worry about it yourself. It's quite easy to get going. It's all just, you just do it all in Python, and it all just works great. So that's, that's why I happen to like it. Um, and once again, uh, slides are available uh, if you want to go and dive in more detail. OK. As for how to build and train neural networks, I think we'll start out with a bit about the architecture. If you want a neural network to, if you want to get a nice neural network that's going to work, I'm going to try and give you some rough ideas of what kind of layers you want to use and where in order to get something that's going to, that's going to give you good results. So your early part of the network is going to be, just after your input layer, is going to be blocks that are going to consist of some number of convolutional layers, two, three, four convolutional layers, followed by a max pooling layer that effectively downsamples. Or alternatively, you could also use striding as well. And then you have another block the same. And you'll note that uh, the notation is that's quite common in the, very, in the academic literature is you specify the number of filters, the number of the number of uh, number of kernels, and then the three specifies the the size. So often you use quite small filters, only three by three kernels. Um, MP2 means max pulling uh, down samples factor two. And notes that after we've we've uh, done the downsampling, you double the number of filters in the convolutional layers. And then finally, at the end, after your blocks are convolutional in the max pooling layers, you're going to have the fully connected or dense, or de also known as dense layers, where you'll typically, um, if you've got quite a large resolution coming out of there, you'll want to, you'll want to work out what the sort of dimensionality is at that point, and then roughly maintain it or reduce it perhaps a bit in your fully connected layer. Uh, you, could have, you could have two or three fully connected layers, if you like. And then finally, you've got your output. And there's the notation for fully connected layers. It's just, that just means uh, 256 channels. Um, OK, so overall, as discussed previously, your convolutional layers are going to detect features in the various locations throughout the image. Your fully connected layers are going to pull all that information together and finally produce the output. Um, there are also some architectures. You could look at the Inception networks by Google or ResNets by Microsoft for inspiration if you want to go and have a look at some, what some other people have been up to. Um, go on to slightly more complex topics. Uh, batch normalization. It's recommended in most cases. It makes things better. Um, it's necessary for deep networks. By the way, I, thought I should tell you, deep learning neural networks, uh, a deep neural network is simply a network of roughly more than four layers. That's, that's all it is. That's what makes them deep. And so if you want particularly deep networks of more than eight layers, you'll want batch normalization. Otherwise, they just won't train very well. Um, they can also speed up training because your, your loss drops, your cost drops faster per epoch. Um, although it can take more, each one can take it longer to run. Um, you can reach lower error rates as well. Um, the reason why it's good is sometimes you've got to think about the, the magnitude of the numbers. You might start out with the numbers of a certain magnitude in your input layer, but that, that magnitude might be increased or decreased by, one, by multiplying by the weights uh, to get to the next layer. And what the, if, you've got, if you stack a lot of layers on top of each other, 
you can find that the magnitude of your values either exponentially increases or exponentially shrinks towards zero. Um, either one of those is bad. It screws the training up completely. So batch normalization, it uh, standardizes it by uh, dividing by the standard deviation, subtracting the mean after each layer. So you, you want to insert it into your convolution of fully connected layers after the matrix multiplication, um, but before adding the bias and before the nonlinearity. So, but the nice thing is Lasagna with a single call does that for you. You don't have to do too much surgery yourself on the neural network. Uh, dropout. It's pretty much necessary for training. Uh, you don't use it at train time, but you don't use it at uh, prediction and test time when you actually want to run a sample through the network to see what its output is. It reduces what's known as overfitting. Overfitting is a particularly horrific problem in machine learning. Um, it's going to bite you all, all it's going to bite you all the time in machine learning. Uh, it's, it's what you get when you train your model on your training data. It's very, very good at, at the samples that are in your initial training set. But when you want to show a new example that's never seen before, it just, it just dies. It fails completely. Um, so essentially what it means is it gets particularly good at those examples. It picks out features of those particular training samples um, and fails to generalize. Um, so dropout uh, combats this. What you're going to do is you're going to randomly choose units in a layer and you're going to multiply a random subset of them by zero, usually about around half of them. And you're going to keep the magnitude of the output the same by scaling it up by a factor of two. And then during test predict, you just run as normal with the dropout turned off. You're going to apply it after the fully connected layers. Normally, you don't bother. You can do it after the convolutional layers as well, but um, the fully connected layers towards the end is normally where you apply it. That's how you put it. That's how you do it in lasagna. And to show you what it actually does, this is with your dropout turned off, so you see all the outputs going through. Those little diamonds represent our dropout. So we take half of them, we pick them and turn them off, and you see the gray, the gray weight lines. What that effectively means is when doing training, the, uh, the back propagation won't affect those weights because the dropout kills them off. And then the next time around, you, you turn off a different subset of them and furthermore. Um, and the reason it works is it causes the this causes the units to learn a more robust set of features rather than sort of learning to sort of co-adapt and develop features that are a bit too specific to those those units. So that's that's roughly how it sort of combats overfitting. Uh, data set augmentation, because training neural networks is notoriously data hungry, you want to reduce the overfitting, uh, and you need to enlarge your training set, and you can do that by artificially modifying existing tra your existing training set by taking a sample and modifying it somehow and adding that modified version to the training set. So for images, you're just going to take your image, you're going to shift it over by a certain amount or up and down by a bit. You're going to rotate it a bit. You're going to scale a little bit, horizontally flip it. Be careful of that one. So for example, if you've got images of people and you vertically flip them so they're upside down, that, could, uh, you'll, that will just screw up your training set. So you've got, when, you, when you're doing data set augmentation, you've got to think about what you need from your data set and what it should output, and think about wh whether your transformations are a good idea. Um, OK, and finally, data, data standardization. Um, neural networks train more effectively when your data set has a mean of 0, all the all values are a mean of 0, and unit variance, or standard deviation of 1. So. And also, with regression, you want to standardize your input data. And with regression, you want to standardize the output. Uh, don't remember that in regression, we are quantifying something, so we're producing real valued outputs. You want to make sure that's standardized as well. I've, I've, I've personally found that and been bitten when I haven't done that. So, um, but uh, when you use your network, when you deploy it, don't forget to uh, do the reverse of the standardization to get it back into the, into the space that you back into the sort of scale and range that you want it to be in the, f in the first place. And to do that, to standardization, you extract all the samples in into an array. And in the case of images, you're just going to go through all the images and extract all the pixels and splat them out into a big, long array, keep all the RGB channels separate, and you're going to compute the, uh, you're going to compute the mean and standard deviation in red, green, and blue. And you're going to zero the mean by subtracting it and then divide by the standard deviation, and that's standardization. 
Okay. When training goes wrong, as it often will, um, you'll notice what you want to do is as you as you train, you want to you want to get an idea of what your lo what the value of your loss function is. When it goes crazy and starts heading towards you know, 10 to the 10 and eventually goes nan, everything's, everything's gone to hell. So you've got to track your loss as you train your neural network so you can watch for this. Um, okay. If you have the error rate equivalent of a random guess, like it's just throwing a dial, throwing a coin, it's not damn well learning anything. And essentially, it's learning to predict a constant value a lot of the time. Um, but sometimes it just, it, it just, there isn't enough um, data for it to pick up the patterns. Um, it can also learn to predict a constant value. Let's say, um, for instance, that you have a data set where, say, you've got them divided into, say, 10 classes, but, say, class, the last class only has about 0.5% of the examples. Now, one of the best ways the sneaky, hard little neural network will figure out a way of, to figure out to cheat you is to simply say that, that, that is to simply never predict that last class because it's only going to be wrong in 0.5% of the cases, and that's actually a pretty good way of getting the loss down to a pretty low value by concentrating on all the other classes and getting those right. Um, and, the, and the problem is, it's a local minima. It's a local minimum uh, of the. You can think of it as a local minimum of your cost function, and neural networks get stuck in those a lot, and it will be the bane of your existence. Um, uh, they most often don't learn what you expect them to or what you want them to. You'll look at it and think, uh, you know, as a human, I know, I know the result is this. And the neural network will learn to pick up features and detect something quite different. Um, so, yeah, welcome to the bane of your existence. And I'm going to illustrate this with a really nice, cool example that uh, is available online. Um, I'm going to talk about how you design a computer vision pipeline using neural networks. With a simple problem like handwritten digits, you could just throw a neural network, one neural network, and it'll do it. Great, wonderful. But for some more complex problems, they're often just not enough. And neural networks are not a silver bullet, so please don't believe all the hype that's around deep learning right now. Um, it's theoretically, po theoretically possible to use a single neural network for a complex problem if you have enough training data, which is often Im an impractical amount. So. For more complex problems, you've got to break the problem down into smaller steps. And I'm going to talk a bit about Felix Lau's second place solution to the Kaggle competition on identifying right whales. Um, so, his first naive solution was to train a classifier to identify individuals. So, I'm going to pull up his website and. Okay, cool. Okay. So, effectively, these patterns on the head of the whale is what you use to identify an individual. And the challenge is to pick out, figure out, given an image of a whale, figure out which individual it is. And this is the kind of image you get in the training set. You've got the ocean surrounding a little whale as he breaches, as he puts, pokes his head over the surface. And you've got to figure out who he is from that picture. So Felix's first solution was just to stick that through a classifier and see what happens. So let me scroll and find out. OK. Baseline naive approach. Here we go. And what he found out is, is that it gave no better than random chance. Hmm. So what he then did is he used what's called saliency detection, where he tried, he got, he used a trick to figure out which parts of the image are influencing the network's output the most. And he found out that actually bits of the ocean were affecting it. Why would it do that? Okay. Try a thought experiment. I want you to imagine that I give you this problem. You've got a bunch of images of right whales, and I say, that's number one, that's number seven, that's number 13. But you've also been given really, really horrendous, horrible amnesia that has completely wiped your mind of the concept of what a whale is, what the ocean is, of just about every human concept you have. So you are literally starting out with images. There's zero knowledge at all, no semantic knowledge about the problem. You can't even guess what it is. You're just given an images and given numbers and then told from this training set, figure out what these are. What are you gonna, what's, what, how are you going to make that decision? Is it the ocean? Is it the whale? You know, what, part of, what, what part of the image is actually helping you make that decision? And when you think about it from the perspective of a neural network, that's where every neural network is starting out from. It's starting out from zero knowledge. And that's why the initial solution didn't work very well. You could do, 
if you had a billion images with all the ground truths and the whale bio the marine biologists have gone, you know, hand classified a billion images of them and put in enormous amounts of human effort because then the signal will eventually come through the noise. But um, we can't practically do that in real life. So um, his solution is, yeah, I mentioned the region-based saliency, so found out they had locked onto the wrong features. So he trained what's called a localizer. Now, I've told you about classifier and classifiers and regressors. Localizers, what they do is they look at an image and they find my, my target point of interest is over there in the image. And so what he did is he found, he got the localizer to take, take that image of the whale and found out that the head is there. And after that, he ran it through the classifiers. The idea is he first gets, trains a network to look for whale, pick it out, crop it out from the image, and then just work on that piece. And then furthermore, he trained a key point finder. Where are we? Whale head aligner, here we go. He trained a key point finder to find the front of the head and the back of the head. So he could then take the image of the whale and rotate it so that they're all in the same orientation and position. And after that, having got sort of really uniform images of whales, he could then run it through the classifier. And eventually, that uh, trained the classifier on oriented and crop whale head images got him second place in the Kaggle competition. So I think that's kind of a, a sort of nice, dis nice, uh, nice illustration of how sort of you've got you to be careful uh, how, to, how you use these things. All right, uh, how am I doing for time? Great, okay. Uh, might even have a bit of extra to go through a few extra things. Never know, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. So, Oxford Net, VGG Net, um, and transfer learning. Using a pre-trained network is often a good idea. The Oxford Net, VGG 19 is a 19 layer neural network. It was trained on that big million image data set called ImageNet. And the great thing is they have generously made the neural network weights file available under Creative Commons license with a CC attribution. And you can get it there. Uh, you, there's also a, a Python pickled version that you can grab hold of as well. They're very simple and effective models. They consist of three by three convolutions, max pooling and fully connected layers. That's the architecture. Um, and if you want to classify an image with VG19, I shall show you an, an IPython notebook that will do that. All right, so we're going to take an image to classify, which is our little peacock here. We load on our network. Oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Cool. So we've got our little peacock who we're going to classify. We're going to load in our pre-trained network. Um, I, I think I better skip over the code a bit, because it's going to be a bit too dull, but effectively, um, you can go through the notebook yourself. It's on the, it's on the GitHub. I hope you don't mind if I spin through this quite quickly. So we're just going through a bit about what the model's like. Um, OK, so this is where we actually build our architecture. So you can see the input layer. We've got our convolutional layers, max pooling. This is all the lasagna API. Uh, we'll skip all this. Uh, we'll go down. Finally, we've got our output, which has got softmax uh, nonlinearity. There you go. Build it. Um, we're going to drop all our parameters in. Beg your pardon. OK, sorry, I, I, this was originally from my tutorial. So anyway, finally, we show our image that we're going to classify. And we predict our probabilities here. And we notice the output is uh, a, one, a vector of 1,000 probabilities. And we find out that the predicted class is 84 with probability 98.99%, which is a peacock. And you can run that yourself, and you can find out that it'll work. So the cool thing is, is you can take the pre-trained network and just use it yourself. And Transfer learning is a cool trick, and this is the last trick I want to show you. Training a neural network from scratch is notoriously data hungry. And the reason is you need a ton of training data. And preparing all that's time consuming and expensive. But what if we don't have enough training data to get good results? We don't have money to prepare, that, prepare it. Well, the ImageNet data set is really huge. There are millions of images with ground truths. 
Um, what if we could somehow use it? To, what if we could somehow use the ImageNet data set with all its vast data to help us with a different task? Well, the good news is we can. And the trick is this: rather than try and reuse the data, you train a neural network like VGG19, or you download VGG19, and you're going to take part of that network and retain it, throw away the end part of it. Um, and, uh, and stick, stick some new stuff on the end that will output what we want. And that way, you effectively train just the bit that you've added and then fine tune it at the end. I'll, I'll go over that. But uh, essentially, what you can do is you can reuse part of VGG19 to, say, classify images that weren't in ImageNet and for classes and you know, different kinds of object category that weren't mentioned in the ImageNet, so you can reuse it. You can reuse it for localization, so you want to find the location of an object, like the location of that whale head, maybe. Uh, or segmentation, where you want to find the exact outline of the boundary. And to do transfer learning, what we do is we're going to take VGG19 that looks like that. Those are all our layers. We're going to chop off those last three. The, the stuff on the left just gets hidden for, so we can show some text. But we chop off those last three layers, and then we create our new ones randomly initialized on the end. Then what we do is you train the network with only your training data, but you're only going to learn the parameters. You're only going to uh, train the parameters on the new layers that you've created. And then you fine tune it, where you train parameters on all the layers, having trained those initial new ones. You, train, you then fine tune the whole lot. You just do, do training this time, updating the parameters of all layers, and this will get you some better accuracy. And the result is a nice, shiny new network with good performance on your particular target domain that's going to be somewhat better than you could get with uh, starting out with your, own with your own data set. OK, so finally, some cool work in the field that might be of interest to you. Uh, Zyla, I think I mentioned this briefly already, but uh, they've visualized uh, an understand, uh, they, uh, in visualizing understanding convolutional networks, they decided to visualize the responses of the convolutional layers to various inputs. So you've seen these images where they decide to visualize what's going on. If ever you want to find out what your network's picking up, this is, this is a good place to look for how to, how to work out what your network is detecting. Um, these guys decide to figure out if they can fool a neural network. So they decide to generate images that are rec unrecognizable to human eyes, but recognized by the network. So for instance, the neural network has a high degree of, of uh, high confidence that that is in fact a robin. It looks, like nan it looks like horrible noise, but it thinks that's a cheetah, that that's an armadillo, that that's a peacock, really. I can't see a peacock there. Um, they then went on to effectively say, well, how can we generate images that do make, sort of make sense to a human? That's a king penguin. That's a starfish. And you can kind of see where it's picking things up. It's looking for texture, but it's not really looking for the actual structure of the object. So it's picking up certain things and ignoring, the, ignoring other quite important features. Um, you can run neural networks in reverse. You can get them to generate images as well as, uh, as well as classify them. So these guys decide to make them generate chairs. So they give the orientation, the design, the color, and the parameters of the chair, and they're trying to generate an image. So you end up with these chairs, and they're even able to morph them. Uh, this one got a lot of press. Neural algorithm artistic style, and if you've ever, if you've, uh, if you've got the Prisma app, you'll know what that's all about on, on iPhone. They took OxfordNet and they extract texture features from one image and they apply them to the other. So you take that photo of, uh, say, uh, the, say, this waterfront, and you take a painting like, say, Starry Night by Van Gogh, and it repaints the image in the style of Van Gogh or in the style of Edward Munch's The Scream or any of these others. It's very, very cool. And the nice thing is there are, there are iPhone apps that do this now. Um, and what these guys did is, this is, this, is, this is a bit of a masterpiece of work. They, uh, they've generated, these, these images of bedrooms are generated by a neural network. And the way they did it is they trained two neural networks, one to be a master forger and the other to be the detective. The master forger tries to generate an image, and the detective tries to tell, is that a real bedroom image of a bedroom, or is that one that's been generated by the, by the forger? And the idea is you co-adapt them to get them both better so that the master forger gets better and better and better until it generates pictures like that, which is kind of cool. 
And they even then took it further by figuring out what the sort of, uh, by combining some of the parameters and uh, how they did, if, you, if you've seen some of the uh, um, results from, uh, you know, the sort of uh, king minus man plus woman equals queen stuff that's been done on some of the, um, the word to vec, thank you, the word to vec models, similar things with, uh, with facial expressions as well. Anyway, I hope you found this helpful. I hope it's been good. Uh, you've been a great audience. Thank you very much. Uh, we have about uh, nine minutes now for the questions. Uh, it was a great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. I have actually several questions. Uh, the first one, uh, when you are modeling a neural network, how do you choose, or is there a way to choose, uh, how many hidden layers and neutrons are there in them? Because uh, I know that's an, that was an issue for me when I was modeling some. Um, I'm not aware of any particular sort of rule of thumb to choose how to design your network architecture. The sort of rule of thumb I use to look at something things that have worked for other people and, and build off that. So the Oxford net architecture where you've got the, um, I found the small convolutional kernels, well people found the small convolutional kernels work well. A few of those layers followed by max pooling or striding and those blocks repeated. Um, I, think, I think there are some people who've probably tried things like grid search where you just sort of try to hold up, you get to automatically alter the architecture but Given the fact that for something like an image net model, your training time can extend even into weeks or hours at least on really big GPUs, that, that can be impractical. So i um, afraid to say it's just rule of thumb as far as I know. Just try it out and see it works. Yeah, well, I, I, I would look up the literature and see what other people have done and just adapt it. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give you more information than that. Uh, my second question, we, we saw that your guys are analyzing images and numbers. Uh, is there a way that you can like uh, make strings input and recognize patterns in them? How would you do that? Would you have to like uh, transform them somehow or? I mean for text processing? Yeah. Um, I think what people tend to do is they tend to use something like word to vec to convert each word into an embedding which is like a 200 or 600 element vector. Um, and then you use what's called a recurrent neural network where rather than just having it go through the output, it goes partially through and then feeds back into an earlier layer. Um, so then it, uh, it, it sort of has an idea of time. Um, I've, not, I've not implemented those models, so I'm, I'm afraid you're, I'm, I'm, I'm outside my uh, comfort zone there in terms of being able to advise you. Um, but look at recurrent neural networks. Uh, but yeah, they, they tend to use the word embeddings. They tend to use the word embeddings to convert the words into a sort of vector. The, the sort of more trivial way of doing that is to just have it turn it into one hot representation where if you've got 2,000 words in your vocabulary, you simply have a, you simply have it one on the, you have a one on the, to represent a word with a vector of all zeros except one for the particular word that it is, but given the sparsity of that input, that often causes problems, which is why they use the embeddings. Uh, and the last question, sorry. Uh, c could you train a neural network to do like math, like uh, addition, maybe multiplication? And if you can, would it be maybe faster than the usual way that the processors are doing it? Um, you can try to do addition. I think actually there are some people who've managed to take the ImageNet data set where you take two handwritten digits in an image, it figures out what they are, and then, and then is trained to produce the sum. Um, it can work. Multiplication, they don't do. And actually, people haven't figured out how to get a neural network to do that. So the models actually can't extend to certain things, which is interesting. Um, so there are certain things they just don't do very well. Um, oh well. Uh, so I think it's quite limited. But as for would it be faster, no way it'd be faster, no. Because you're using a hell of a lot of mathematical operations just to do something that is a, is a one instruction operation on your processor. So sure. Uh, thanks for the talk. Really, really interesting and great stuff at the end around the images. Um, what are your thoughts on how um, neural networks could be applied to 
text analytics? Because most people don't do that. Um, text analytics. Um, it's outside my area, so I don't know. But uh, I would speak to uh, Catherine Jamal. She's here, and she did a very, very good talk uh, describing the sort of uh, the sort of. She gave a really, really good intro and a really, really good sort of overview of what the sort of text processing world is like. And she gave quite a few neural network models. Neural networks are some of the best models for it now, but it's outside my area of expertise. But she knows her stuff on that, so I'd speak to Catherine Jamal. Any other question? Hello. The, the name of neural networks comes from the science of the brain. Do you know if it's uh, used widely in, in brain science? Um, not sure. Um, I think that the I think the model that we use for our neural networks that I've been talking about here is quite different from our neurons in the brain work. I think that my my very very basic layman's understanding of brain neurons is they they operate on spike rate. So they have a they they in, they generate output spikes, and it's the frequency of that that is roughly the strength of their output, um, I think. I don't know. Uh, so I think that uh, sort of trying to um, liken these to one another is, um, I, I don't think that they're that much alike. Uh, I think that the where, where the similarity is is that people looked at how neurons in the brain are all hooked up to each other, and they said, how can we make something that models this? Um, but what we've got is something that seems to work well given our processes and seems to produce very good pattern recognition. Um, but uh, as for similarities to the brain beyond that, I don't feel comfortable saying any more. Any other questions? Hi. Um, have you heard of the self-driving car using deep learning to implement how they drive it? I wonder how they would update uh, the cost function because it's a stream of video rather than a fixed static output. I've heard about it. Um, I'm not sure how the hell they're doing it. Uh, I don't know. Um, hmm. I suppose if you, were to, if you were to try and do something like that, one of the things you could do is you could prepare a bunch of footage where you say the human who's driving this car has done well, as in they haven't crashed it or killed anyone or done something silly like that. So the idea is that all well, that's good. And maybe if there are some footage of some accidents, they say, that's bad, don't do that. Or what they do is, the, what, what you probably want to do is, you want to say, given this video, have these outputs, as in steer like this, accelerate and brake like this, produce these uh, decisions. Um, so that's actually a little bit like, a little bit like the Atari game playing neural networks that Google developed, the, the stuff where they got the really good scores on the video games where they take the input, the screen, and they decide whether to move up, down, left, right, shoot. But it's a similar thing, whereas instead of deciding whether to move up, down, left, right, and shoot, you're, you're controlling the steering wheel, the accelerator, and the brakes. You could do it like that, but um, given my experience of it, and given the fact that, as I, as I mentioned, if you have particularly rare examples, rare situations, where quite often the neural network will just cheat and not, you know, just because they might make up 0.0001% of your training set, uh, it'll, never, it'll never actually bother to learn anything from those. It'll just, uh, the cost function, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll discover a local minima that ignores them. I would not be very comfortable getting into a car that was just controlled by a neural network. I would not want to put my life in, in the hands of a vehicle like that. But that might be how you could build it. But whether it would, I don't think it would be very good. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Do you ever combine neural networks with other techniques like uh, approximation algorithms? Approximation algorithms? Yeah, like optimization techniques. I was thinking about travel salesman problem, for example. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's, I, haven't, I haven't tried them for that. Um, I'm, not I'm not aware. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if someone's tried it, but I'm not aware of it because I've not looked at it, I'm afraid. Um, hmm. That's a difficult one. I'm afraid I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, you'd, have, you'd, have to, you'd have to figure out a way of coming up with some kind of cost function that measures how, measures how good its solution is. So 
how one would go about doing that in certain problems, I don't know. But. So I have time for one last question. Maybe it's kind of a technical question about Teano, but uh, when you apply um, dropout, does the uh, expression get re uh, recompiled, reoptimized to be efficient, you know, not to take account of that uh, sort of, of those uh, weights, or uh, they get actually, you know, you, the floating point operation get to the GPU or CPU, but they are zero, so they don't affect the, the gradient. I think it's the second, because what you do is you get it to, you get this random number generator, generate either a zero or a one, and then you, multi you put that multiply in the expression, so I think it's just, uh, it's not actually optimizing. I think it'd be quite difficult to optimize, because the problem is, um, um, for every single sample in the mini-batch, you're actually blocking out a different sort of subset of the, of the units, so I'm not even sure how one would actually go about optimizing in an efficient way because you've got to almost select which units you're dropping out and then sort of from that decide what you can, what operations you can save and you can't do, got to do that on the fly and I think that'd be quite tough. So I'm guessing it, I would guess that it doesn't, but yeah. So now, um, since there are no other questions, so I'll probably uh, thank Jeff for his wonderful talk. Uh, <laughs> And probably I'll say yes, enjoy lunch.